So I've come back to Vanarama to uh, see Paul Kirby, my resident electric van expert. And we're going to look at the future, what's coming out in the short term, how things can develop in the medium term, and then some of the sort of mind-blowing sci-fi evolutions and revolutions that are going to be happening in the electric van market in the long-term future. And obviously I'm joined, as you can probably see, by a very special guest today. And we're here. Thank you, Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, you know. But this, isn't this amazing? So we're at the Arrival yes. workshop. This is just... I've been hoping to come here for a long time. And today we're looking at the Mercedes e Vito. But the capacity is massive. So, Paul, give me your predictions, and I'll expect them to be extremely accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so, the short term, let's think about what's, what's happening, even as we speak, and probably for the next six, nine months. So, we know that the Vavaro is, is now able to order it. That's a good looking van, and it's got good range and payload and all those kind of things. So, you think that um, you know, it will follow on with its partner vans or the Brotherhood of Van with the Peugeot Expert, the Citroën Dispatch, and the Toyota Pro Ace. So that's the medium van sector looked after. There are some small vans coming in the Bilingo and the Partner. And the Renault Zoe van? The Renault Zoe van has just been launched as well, yes. So we're seeing a few ground up electric vehicles starting to come to market now with the Zoe and also the Maxus that we've talked about before. The Maxus will be bringing out the eDeliver 9, which is um, a ground up electric vehicle in the large van sector. We'll probably see the Fiat e Ducato launched and then the Boxer. Um, and the Citroen Relay uh, also will be electrified. Yeah, it sounds like the next 12 months, the number of fans available mm. is going to double, if not more. I, I would like to think so. And, and of course, the Mercedes-Benz e-Sprint is coming out as well, the Vito's big brother. I believe we will start to see a decent number of vans on the road. Because you're designing something from the ground up, yeah. they've redesigned the, the interior to be far more useful for yes. that purpose. But even like some of the materials they're using, like it's, it wasn't carbon fibre, but, but... It's a sort of plastic and fibre glass. Yeah, 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 extraordinary. So they've, they've not just gone, oh, we'll take a traditional van, yeah. shape design and just put an electric no. motor in there. They've gone, right, let's change how we build it, yeah. the what shape it's made of it, of. what it's made yeah. of. And actually, if you look at the, because that's the thing I always forget, because that looks like quite a big vehicle. But if you actually look at the wheelbase, it would be the same as a Mercedes, a mid-sized Mercedes van or a Nissan van. But the capacity is massive. The storage space that's got in the back is more than double. You would get in that because the cab is much smaller. You know, there's no bonnet and all that stuff. All the vans I've driven so far have been the traditional, your, your, yeah. your Mercedes and your Renaults and your Maxis and that. And they're very much the taking the shell of the yeah, old of the traditional diesel band, ones yeah. and just put batteries in there. I mean, there's a slight changes, but yeah, I, I don't. So I don't think they've necessarily made the best use of the space that you could have yeah. because you're not using batteries. Yeah. Whereas vans like these, because they've been designed literally, they start with a battery, yeah. and then the. I mean, I think what will happen probably in the next sort of five to ten years is. Vauxhall will come out with a, a van that doesn't look hugely dissimilar to that because it just makes more sense. But what they're doing at the moment is just using the machine tools and everything they've already got yeah. to, so they can mass produce them. And, you know, it's a, a, a thing of economics, isn't it? But I think the next generation of electric vans, because they're going to be electric, you know, people yeah. aren't going to, oh, yeah. they're not going to carry on making diesel vans for very long. No. So, I mean, Arrival aren't the only sort of EV specific company that are making no. these sort of vehicles. Well, the one we heard of recently is Rivian. So, you know, Rivian launched their big pickup truck, which everybody went crazy about. But actually what they, well, I didn't know until afterwards, what they're actually making is 100,000 electric vans for Amazon yeah. in, in the United States. So that's their, that's their bread and butter. So this van, specs wise, you know, range, load, sizes, options, what have we got? 
Well, so you've got two formats for this one, the Pure and the Progressive. Uh, the Pure is the standard model, um, and it comes with a quite a decent standard spec, actually. So you've got uh, air conditioning, um, and one of the things that Mercedes-Benz are famous for is having all of the safety kit in these vehicles. You know, emergency brake distribution, those kinds of things will really, really kick in. You've also got twin side loading doors, which is great for an urban operation, you know, so whichever way you park, you're, you're e easily able to get in and out of the, uh, the side of the van where you want it to be. Um, and it's just got that standard quality feel that a Mercedes-Benz comes with. Yeah. Now, there's two different lengths of vehicle. Yep. Now, we were discussing this earlier, yes. and, and I couldn't see much point because the difference in length is like 23 centimetres. Yes. However, you put a good argument for why there's, why there's a difference. Well, so when you're thinking about vans, it's, it's all about what you can fit in it yeah. and in terms of length or height or width. And, and so the width between the wheel arches must be able to get a Euro pallet. Yeah. And, you know, how many Euro pallets can you get in length? Maybe two, maybe three. Um, so lots of uh, building materials come in three meter length. So to actually just go over the three meter length is, is a value. And of course, for every a bit you stick on the back, you lose a little bit in payload unless you increase the gross vehicle weight. The bottom line is getting the right van is all about making sure it's fit for purpose for yeah. your operation. So whether it's 25 cent, 23 centimeters shorter or longer actually can make all the difference. Yeah. Now, range wise, the stated range is like 93 miles yeah. average. I think it's just like 104 in extra urban and then 80 81 in the motorway yeah. driving extra urban if we were to drive out of the warehouse that we're in today um that would be extra urban it's proper industrial estate stop start kind of motoring yeah. where you're getting regeneration from the brakes um and you know back into the the battery and you're getting good range but then when you stick it on the motorway and just keep on going it, it tends to not enjoy that quite so much People often buy electric cars because you know, they like the sort of technology or because of the, sort of the green value they have. Yeah. But when it comes to commercial vans, the key word there is commercial. Yes. It, it's a business thing. Yeah. So the, the van has to hopefully pay for itself. But also, I mean, you know far more about this than I do, the, the uh, vehicle to grid stuff. That yeah. a, a company can actually make money back when it's charging its vans. Yes, I mean, that's the, that's the key thing, really. because And that's being ex experimented with now. So the idea that you have, I don't know, say, let's say a big company has 500 electric vans like this, and they're charging them at night. So they charge them on off-peak electricity, or they produce their own electricity on the roof of their building. You know, all those, there's all those advantages where they really reduce their running costs enormously. But the, the key thing now is the potential for, say, you, the shift ends at, for half the vans at five o'clock, and you plug them all in. They've got a bit of juice left in all the batteries, yep. and you sell that to the grid for a lot of money. That's serious income, because you're selling you know, megawatts of power if you've got hundreds of vans. That then becomes a whole other revenue stream from the vehicle. And then, then, then in the middle of the night, they all charge up again, so they're ready to go in the morning. And over in the States, you know, if you look at Amazon, if they've got hundreds of thousands of vehicles, because yeah. they're going to have a, a part of Rivia, it's 100,000 vehicles. Yeah. So yeah, if you're, if you're charging those vehicles to grid, and you're only making a few pence per vehicle per day, you're yeah. still making millions yes. a week yes. just by charging it at the right time. At the right time, you're saving so much. And also, with big facilities, like a big distribution facility that Amazon would have, like there is next door here, bizarrely, yeah. massive roof, you, you can have like 500 kilowatts of solar on that. Well, that will save you millions of pounds a year if you compare that to how much you spend on diesel. You know, so that, yeah. And I think, as we're seeing, companies are going, ah, oh, it's nothing to do with green or being yeah. planet-friendly. It's to do with money. And that's what will drive the technology the fastest. And actually, the thing about the planet is, the planet will be fine. Yeah. It's just us. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Planet's going, yeah, whatever, guys. You carry on burning coal. I'll We're wait. Fine. You won't be here forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter whether you're a huge operation or if you're just, you know, you're a, you're a plumber. If your van's broken, you can't go to work. You can't earn money. You know, you can't feed the kids and pay the mortgage. So the quicker you can get that van fixed, the better. And, and if we're now seeing electric vans that are slightly more modular, yeah. as far as the internal working's going, and you turn up somewhere and they go, right, that's, that's your problem right there, pop that out, slot another one in, yeah. off you go. Yeah. You know, you're in for half an hour and you're, and you're away. Even, even better than that, they're doing a lot of the stuff over the air. So, uh, you know, we think of Tesla and what they do with their cars. Most of the um, 
challenges that, uh, that the vehicles are finding are able to be dealt with over the air or identified over the air yeah. and then the parts waiting for the person when they come in and that's what we're hoping and expecting with you know particularly with arrival they've talked about that sort of autonomous robots coming out taking out parts of the vehicle taking them away and then bringing the new part putting it in and sending them on their way well, that all feels very achievable with the kind of technology that we've got yeah. uh, available to us. Since we recorded this episode, Arrival have released images of the latest iteration of the electric delivery vans. Although these will not be available until 2022, when these do start being built, fully charged will be there to get the scoop. In the meantime, the Mercedes e Vito. What's it like to drive? It's smooth. Uh, I've said it before that electric vehicles uh, were then maybe not as engaged as you may be if you've got a, a, a combustion engine car with a handbrake and a gear stick. But if you're driving through heavy traffic in London for work, you know, uh, up the motorway, EV cars are just much easier, smoother, and less stressful to drive. And this is no different. And in fact, of all the electric vans I've driven so far, this is the nicest. It's nice to drive, it's nice to sit in. The, the cab is a bit more luxurious than, uh, than the rest of the, the commercial vehicles I've come across, as you'd probably expect from Mercedes, and, and the price kind of ref reflects that. But just the steering wheel, the feel of it, you know, the, 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 how comfortable the seat is, again, is a step up from what I've seen before. And price-wise, how much to buy, and then how much to lease? The list price of the vehicle is just under 40,000, 39,800 something for the, the basic L2 van, and then it goes up, um, I think, to about 42,000 for the, the higher spec vehicle. But the good news is that when uh, these vans come out, they're eligible for the plug-in van grant, which can be up to 8,000 pounds. So that comes off the list price, and, and then, uh, so you're buying the vehicle for about 32,000 pounds. You might get- Excluding some. VAT. Excluding yeah. that, yes. Once that translates into a lease cost, it can be around 430, 440 pounds a month okay. for the standard model. But then that you only go up slightly for that extra 2,000, you might only go up another 20 pounds a month. Yeah. So you might be able to get the high spec vehicle. But as we said earlier, it's about getting the right vehicle for the yeah, right yeah, job. Yeah. Plus in places like London, I suppose you're saving money because you're not paying the, the, the congestion charge and all that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah. So, There's uh, a lot of incentives yeah, to go to electric vehicles and we know that some of the other cities in, in the UK are considering similar schemes um, and particularly around vans because they account for such a high percentage of the emissions in cities. Down here, oh hello, is the, the charge point for the 7 kilowatt uh, charger. That's where obviously you would have filled up traditionally with diesel or petrol or whatever. Now that seven kilowatt charger will charge the battery, which is 41 kilowatt hour battery. And that's the most you can put in there. So uh, if, you're, if you're new to EVs, um, just to be clear, I can park at a seven kilowatt uh, charger or I can park at a 43 kilowatt charger. It doesn't matter. This will only accept seven kilowatts. Um, that's the most energy you can put in there. And it will take about six hours to charge that battery from empty to full. Um, you can plug it in to you know, a three pin domestic plug, but um, I wouldn't advise it because it'll take you about 20 hours to charge that battery if you do that. Now, obviously that range will be affected a little bit by the cold, um, but also by load. Roughly, you might lose 2% of range per 100 uh, kilos, but that's a, that's a rough estimate. It really depends on, on, on the temperature and how you drive it. The difference between the specs, the two different trims, isn't, isn't vast. So um, the standard version you know, comes with 10 channel infotainment system, whereas the, the progressive one, the, the, the level up from that has 15. And then the progressive level also has a lumbar support for the driver and it has a speed limiter. Uh, as well, which actually is quite handy, I find, especially when you're trying to stay below 50 miles an hour on the many, many, many motorway uh, roadworks that we have here in the UK. That's the only, the only real difference. There is a few um, optional extras you can get, um, but you can have that in, in, in any trim. The best one for, for payload is the, the standard, the shorter wheelbase model with the basic trim, and that'll do sort of 923 kilograms. Uh, and other end of the scale, the sort of the least good for, for payload is the is the long wheel based version with the with the more sort of upmarket trim, 
um, the progressive trim and that'll do I believe uh, 880 kilograms so that extra length and the extra bells and whistles in the cab are going to weigh something and that's got to come off uh, your total payload unfortunately that long wheelbase it's not much that extra 23 centimeters but it's enough to put you over the three meter mark which is very handy for some people however you should note something your total length is to here there's a little cut back there so you can't load three meter stuff all the way up to here it's only in this back bit i've got to say there's not quite as much poke you know quite as much thrust from a from a standing start as i was expecting it's quite a sort of smooth sedate roll off you know from uh, from the start line uh, and bearing in mind this van is empty right now i've got nothing in the back at all height wise again the height obviously varies with um, with the load you put in there which we know very well because we'd planned to film this today in a car park that's 1.92 meters high and this fully laden is 1.91 meters high however empty which is how it is now it's close to 1.95 which is why we're not filming in an underground car park apart from that the lease price well if you lease it roughly 420 440 a month depending on which one you get um, and then to buy the vehicle uh, new excluding vat it's between sort of basically 40 grand and 42 grand depending on which size and trim you go for uh, but that's not including any government grants that might be available for example in the uk right now you've got an eight thousand pound government grant available and that'll reduce the uh, total to what 32 34,000. and that is the mercedes evito the evito certainly has the quality trim and finish one would expect from a mercedes-benz and it's a nice van to drive and it's lovely to sit in very luxurious and comfortable and it's great to see more of the big manufacturers getting into the electric van market however with a similar price tag to something like the Vauxhall Vivaro, but with significantly less range, no option to tow and without rapid charging, it's hard to see how the EV2 will compete with business consumers who need practicality over style and want maximum bang for their buck. And then the dream is you get one of these and you have it as your camper van. Yes. <laughs> Because the reason I'm doing the van series is not because I drive like commercial vans normally, but because I've had loads of, of Campers, um, yeah. camper vans. So yeah. I, in fact, my motorhome currently is like almost eight meters long, and I did walk in here and go, that I could, could I could, could get a could couple of double beds in there, little kitchenette there, a toilet at the back, yeah. a shower. But also, you could have a little fold-out solar panels there to charge it. Well, I'm thinking the, you know, the whole roof is one big solar yeah. panel. Oh yeah, and then a fold-out little wind turbine. Yeah, yeah. Oh park yeah, it, park it by the Ooh. coast. Oh. That's my retirement, just yes. live that for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to our Patreon supporters and YouTube members, without whose support episodes like this would not be possible and neither would the maintenance of our independence as a channel. If that's something you might be interested in, please take a look at the links below. As well as that, liking and subscribing to these videos helps a lot too. And on the next episode, I'll be visiting another company who've been using electric vans commercially for years and years now to get some real world feedback on how they've been performing. As well as that, I'll be looking at this, the new Vauxhall Vivaro E, which I think might be a front runner when it comes to our electric van summary. And apart from that, as always, if you have been, thanks for watching. So final and most important question, when can I get my hands on a flying van? Uh, 2050. Because I sure. won't be here. I'm not sure I'll be here either. <laughs> uh, 2050. Never mind. I'm sure Robert still will be. He'll be hanging in there.